when the Europeans start to arrive in Pennsylvania, the popular understanding is it's about 90 to 95% forest covered. So they probably developed the mindset, just looking at all those trees, we can cut trees down forever, and there are always gonna be trees because they're just everywhere, they're in the way. They were coming from a very heavily agrarian society in Europe. You need space to plant fields and till crops. They won't grow in and amongst the trees, so they need to be cut out of the way to make room for the fields. They need to be cut down to make houses and sailing ships and wagons and everything else that you need to sort of recreate that agrarian society here in the new world. As this new world was taking shape, it was discovered that the region had an abundance of white pine growth. And white pine has a tendency to grow very tall, very straight, and was very desirable as used as ship mass. So that's really where the beginning of the lumber industry in Pennsylvania had taken off, was seeking out that these white pines for shipbuilding. The history of this then burgeoning industry is celebrated here at the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, located in Potter County. And the exhibit, we talk about challenges and choices. The choice is basically to cut a tree down or leave a tree standing. The challenge is trying to balance that aspect. And the whole site sort of talks about how that ha hasn't always been in balance throughout the history of the Commonwealth. Starting in somewhere about the 1840s or so, the harvesters moved into the forest and started to move timber, primarily along the river systems. If you look at the river systems, we've got the Susquehanna River, comes down through Williamsport. And so you had major drainages that came into Williamsport. Sometimes you could just send the logs down themselves down the river, and they could be caught then by log booms. So there were booms, especially around the Susquehanna River. Williamsport had a major log boom as well. And then the free floating logs would just get captured by this boom and sorted to mills down there. Prior to sending your log down, you want to make sure you brand it with your log stamp, basically a hammer that would mark the end of the log with the individual brand so that you could be properly compensated for your lumber. Thanks to the abundance of wood floating down the rivers, dozens of sawmills opened in the area, making Williamsport the lumber capital of the United States. And it's the Millionaire's Row, and so there were more millionaires in the city of Williamsport than any other city in the nation. To float the wood down the rivers more efficiently, logs could be assembled into rafts, held together by ropes and saplings. At the same time, there were logs moving in the Allegheny River system. Uh, logs in the Allegheny moved all the way to New Orleans so that you would float down the river system, the Ohio, the Mississippi, to New Orleans, and then walk home in time to do it again the next spring. And so it was, it, these were rough and tumble people who made livings off of forest. The rafters themselves, a lot of them were a different breed from the woodcutters. They were specialists in their field because the rafts were unwieldy and they had to be uh, steered. And there was a steering paddle on the front and also on the back. They also lived on the rafts. One of the great stories that the rafters tell is when you did get in the big water into Ohio, and that's where the money was. Well, what did they eat mostly? Potatoes. They kept buckets of them. Those rafters that had to watch at night would walk along the edge of the raft, and then occasionally they'd pick up a potato and they would throw it from whatever side they were on. And if they didn't hear a splash, they would yell, hard right rudder or hard left rudder, <laughs> because they knew they were getting too close to shore. So not only was the uh, potato essential to keep them going, but it was also was their radar, so to speak. <laughs> Starting in about 1885, there was a confluence of technology development. One was we created a cross-cut saw that had raker teeth, and so you could fell trees with a saw rather than an axe. And there was the development of light gauge railroads. And we began harvesting trees away from river systems, and that continued from about 1885 to about 1920. 
There were a number of women who actually were employed by logging camps as cooks or cookies. A cookie is an assistant to the cook. Obviously, the cook is preparing the meals, three meals a day for, you know, anywhere from maybe 25 to 100 men in a log camp. There was an insatiable demand for lumber. It really built the nation. It didn't just build Pennsylvania infrastructure. By the time you reach the 1870s and 80s, and we're looking at Western expansion after the Civil War, a lot of our lumber is being shipped out West to build towns. So by the time we become national leader in lumber production, you know, we're har harvesting, you know, probably 5 million trees in the course of a year, which is a lot. Pennsylvania's forests were being cut at an alarming rate. And all of a sudden, people were looking out their windows, and instead of seeing green hills, they were seeing mudslides. And uh, we just get to a point where uh, we have asked the forest to do too much. And it can't continue to regenerate on its own. Watch full episodes of Keystone Stories now on the PBS video app.